So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, uh, or good evening, almost. So it's my very big pleasure to, to start this new series on sustainability, which there will be events on problems that are really important for Switzerland. And maybe um, tonight we don't have the least important. We're going to talk about skiing, something that is uh, deep embedded in, in Swiss culture. My name is uh, Michi Lening. I'm a joint professor on cryospheric sciences here between the EPFL and the WSL SLF in Davos. So my life happens uh, between Davos, uh, Lausanne, and now New Association. And yes, I, I do also ski. So we see uh, that skiing and sustainability. I think uh, a lot of you in uh, this, this early fall were impressed by the fact that um, the Swiss uh, federal government uh, told you to take cold showers but didn't stop the snow guns in the ski areas. So this is something that we could observe. There were a lot of uh, energy that was used for uh, producing artificial snow. And this is one of the subjects that we're going to address uh, tonight. But in general, one can see that our mountains, uh, they see a lot of pressure from different sides. But the first obvious and one is, is from climate change. We all know that the snow is uh, much less. So this is an extreme winter that we are living right now. Um, they talk about a very dry summer if things don't change uh, in these next few weeks. And this is all related so, to the fact that uh, we, we don't have enough natural snow anymore in our mountains. This is uh, something that we will see more often in the future with a warmer climate. A warmer climate doesn't necessarily uh, mean that there is no more skiing. Skiing can happen in, in high elevations. And uh, in fact, this was a good weekend for those of you who were out there. There could be really some really good skiing, even powder snow skiing on, on the right slopes. The question is just, will it be the same in the future as it is now? And uh, this is the, the subject of today. We see pressure on the snow, but we, not only on the snow. <coughs> the mountains also um, are under pressure from different sides. Well, we have just started a discussion on whether or how much um, solar energy should we produce in our, in our mountains. Something that our own group researches in quite detail is uh, how can we produce enough electricity in winter times without depending too much on import. And one solution could be to put solar panels in high alpine environments, but in order to significantly produce electricity such that it really helps our winter energy gap a lot of area of uh, solar panels would be required. This is not so easy to achieve. And the question is, is this a, a good development or is this not a good development? So the pressure on the landscape in the high mountains and, uh, is, is on for several reasons. Then another question is whether we would like to have more wind turbines uh, in high alpine terrain. This is something that also our speaker, I'm going to introduce him in, in a little bit, uh, has a background on and uh, may have uh, may touch upon. So that pressure on the mountains from, from diverse sites is, is our subject of, of tonight. And in particular, with respect to the future of skiing. We have uh, a real expert on this uh, with us is uh, Mathieu Scher. It's my big pleasure to introduce him in some detail. He's a homebrew from EPFL has did his studies here. He has been in foreign countries, but uh, he was not only an excellent student, but he has always been also a passion for the snow as a snowboarder. And he has um, made um, this to his profession a side of being, a, as I said, a good student and now is a good scientific collaborator with Meteo Swiss. What he learned, he did actually his uh, master thesis, he did in our group uh, with a PhD student, Sharon Dujardin, together, and they uh, developed a machine learning model how to better estimate winds in alpine terrain. And this general knowledge he is now applying also in Meteo Swiss. And so if you thought that there is room for improvement of the weather forecast, then uh, the pressure is on Mathieu to, to make this better. And I think he will uh, perform quite well. Uh, personally, looking back on the last winter, especially the forecast for the mountainous areas had quite some bias. And this is not easy because the, the models, they are improving all the time and the, a good forecast 
in Lausanne doesn't mean that also the mountains are forecasted in, in a good way. So Mathieu is now in charge of uh, improving these forecasts with machine learning models, and in particular developing these machine learning models in the ever-increasing and ever-improving uh, numerical model chains. So it's again, as I said, uh, my, my great pleasure to welcome Mathieu to, to this talk. He will give us a lot of food for thought, and after that, we will have time to discuss it. And I already encourage you to prepare some questions for the panel. I also welcome our panel that will be introduced after Matthew's talk. With no further ado, Matthew, the floor is yours. OK, thank you, Miki, for the kind introduction. And thank you to remind me that I have still a lot of work to do to have a more reliable forecast so you can go uh, skiing in the mountains. So, um, hi everyone, I'm glad to be back at EPFL. I graduated here, graduated here in the School of Environmental Science and Engineering. And I'm especially happy to be here to talk about a subject that is uh, dear to me because it links uh, some of my greatest interests in life on one side uh, meteorology and climatology, which is the subject of my daily work at Metal Suisse, and in, other, in the other side, uh, my passion for snowboarding, which I've been practicing at, at the professional level since uh, more than 14 years. Okay, so when I think about the future of skiing, uh, there are two uh, aspects that cross my mind. First is how climate change is affecting the snow condition uh, and what can we expect in the future. And then the second is how could the ski industry reduce its large contribution to global warming and do better in terms of ecological impacts. So to start with, we can uh, look at the change we have been observed in the last decades and century uh, because of global warming in Switzerland. So first of all, um, the Swiss average temperature has risen by 2.5 degrees since pre-industrial levels, and this is twice more than the global average. And related to that, there are different indicators uh, that are relevant for skiing that we can observe. For example, a decrease of up to 60% of less frost days so frost days is when uh, the temperature at night goes below zero degree. So it's a good proxy for suitable condition for skiing because the people like, that like ski touring in the spring, they know that it's important to have a good refreeze at night. Um, besides, we also observe uh, that the, the, the zero degree line, the altitude of the zero degree line in winter has reason by about 400 meters. Um, and then basically, now we found at 1,000 meter the condition that were prevailing uh, at 600 meters in the 60s when the advent of skiing in Switzerland occurred. So if you think of it, there were no ski lift at those altitudes. Uh, of course, because it was raining more than it was snowing uh, in winter, and there were no not enough snow availability. But those conditions now, we observe them at around 2,000 meters, which is altitude where we have uh, the bottom of our ski resort and where we have slopes. And as a consequence of that, if you look at, for example, the number of days where we have snow on the ground, we see that it drops by about 50% below 800 meters and by about 20% uh, around 2,000 meters. And for the, later, uh, for the latter, of course, this happened uh, later in the spring uh, because of earlier melting or also a bit in the fall. And as you know, also a big loss of glacial volume in the Alps. So here we, look, we can look at uh, another indicator. So it's the number of days with, uh, where the temperature remains below zero. And this is for a single weather station in Davos. And I think this is also a good proxy for what I call optimal, optimal condition uh, for skiing because uh, when you have those conditions after a snowfall, uh, that 
remains for a while. All the powder uh, addicts like me, they're happy because the snow can remain good to ski for weeks. And by the way, it's also uh, the necessary condition you need to have artificial snow to produce. And then as you can see here, um, despite the ha high interannual variability, because this is due to the chaotic nature of the atmosphere, you still see a clear uh, decreasing trend. So here, uh, it's another indicator. It's uh, the number of snowy days. Uh, so when you have precipitation in the form of snow, for two locations, um, the first is Chateau Day at 1,000 meters, and then the Sentis at 2,500 meters uh, in the northeastern Switzerland. And you can see, again, in both cases, um, as uh, snowy days are replaced by rainy days, um, this is uh, decreasing. And of course, the higher you go, the more uh, this change happens outside winter, at least at the moment. But when it's raining instead of snowing, it makes really a big difference on the snowpack because instead of accumulating snow, you actually melt what's already there uh, much faster. So it's really highly uh, nonlinear. And we had a really good example uh, at Christmas when we had a uh, really warm temperature and we have uh, a few uh, heavy rain uh, all the way up to 2,000 meters and which, uh, watch out, which, which uh, wash out all the snow and also artificial snow that was already there for er from earlier in December. Okay, now, so we have seen how snow condition uh, has deteriorated deteriorated in the past, uh, in the last few decades, but now we can look into a projection into the future. So here you see simulation of the winter average temperature in the Alps for two uh, different emission scenarios. So for the first one, uh, the RCP 2.6 assume it's an optimistic scenario that assumes a strong and rapid reduction of greenhouse gas emission uh, towards zero. Uh, by the end of the century. And then the other scenario, the 8.5, is a very pessimistic one that assumes that global emission will continue to rise. Um, and we refer uh, to it as the business as usual scenario. So if you look uh, at the first column, so the horizon 2035, you see that there is not much difference between the two scenarios. Uh, in both cases, temperature has continued to increase because our, of our current uh, dependency on fossil fuels. But when you look at the third and at the second and third column for the second half of the century, you see that the differences get bigger and bigger. And on the case of the optimistic scenario, you see that the temperature in the Alps in winter stabilize at, uh, at the level of 2035 uh, all the way to the end of the century. And on the other side, uh, for the pessimistic one, you have uh, temperature continue to rise all the way to four plus four degrees, which will mean also an increase of the zero degree line of about 800 meters and 1,000 meters, making obviously skiing uh, in many places in the Alps very uh, complicated, if not impossible. So here uh, we see again uh, at the indicator of the number of snowy days. And then here I picked uh, the, the top of the ski resort Molaison. Um, and I choose it, so it's just below 2,000 meters. And I choose it because Molaison is already a ski resort that is affected by climate change. And uh, for this reason, they took this as an opportunity to diversify. And I just read that nowadays they make more turnover in the summer than in the winter. So if you look at the RCP 2.6, you see that there is a drop of about 20% of snowy days compared to the 90s, but this is quickly stabilized. If you go to an intermediate scenario now, um, the drop continued towards the end of the century to reach minus 35%, and then on the, on the pessimistic scenario, we have a drop of uh, 50%, which means that on top of the Molaison, uh, with this scenario, by the end of the century, half of the days where it snows, in winter it will be raining. So, of course, it will be not possible to, 
to ski there. So to me, what's the, what those results suggest is that, of course, in the next decade or two, condition will going to get more and more difficult. But on the long term, uh, the viability of skiing in Switzerland largely depends on the ability of the world to reduce global emission or not. So to me, it's not over yet. There is still a card to play, and especially because the 2.6 scenario is technically feasible. So I think um, it's an opportunity for the ski industry to be a role model here, and maybe the new role of the ski industry will be to um, communicate to the public what they could lose because of climate, climate change and advocate for solution and strong uh, climate policy. Because actually, skiing or winter tourism in Switzerland, it's 1% of the uh, total GDP. It's 18,000 jobs. It's the lungs of many of the Alpine villages. Um, it's, as Mickey said, it's part of the Swiss culture. And because also Alpine regions are at the forefront of climate change, I think protecting our winter is a really good narrative that people can relate to, to contribute to the protection of the climate. And this is exactly what uh, we've been trying to do with the NGO called Protect Our Winters, in which I've been involved since uh, many years. And then here the goal is really to unify uh, the outdoor community to uh, raise our voice for the protection of the climate. And uh, the outdoor community, uh, it's millions of people in developed countries. And we have different national chapters in e each of the each of the skiing country in Europe and in North America. So this could give you um, a good insight of how winter could look, how a normal winter could look like in the future uh, if we don't reduce uh, worldwide emission rapidly with basically no snow in the village and, and on the lower slope and only uh, some snow higher up. And of course, you can think, well, you can, for the village that have surrounded by high mountains, you can always bring people much higher up. In Zamat, you can ski uh, all year long, basically. But still, and with the help of artificial snow, you could always provide higher up good condition, a good groomed slope for people skiing on the slope. But you can still wonder, um, question, whether this will still attract as many people in the future, because to me, what uh, people like about winter holidays is also the beautiful scenery of a village covered by snow. It's the ability to snowshoes, to sled with the kids, to play in the snow, um, and uh, without having to buy a lift ticket to go 600 meters higher up. And also, we see that there is more and more myself included, people that like ski touring or free riding, and this completely relies on natural snow, of course. So to me, this is a bit the kind of winter scenery that made me fall in love with uh, snowboarding. And I hope uh, we can preserve those in the future. OK, so while we see that it makes sense for the ski industry, to advocate for strong climate policy. Uh, if the ski industry wants to remain credible and attractive in the world with growing environmental awareness, I think it should also contribute to reduce its own carbon footprint and uh, more generally uh, its ecological impact. So here you see the average carbon footprint of a ski day uh, in the different categories. And what we can observe is that we find the same sector, sectors that we need to improve in order to uh, decarbonize our economy in Switzerland. So we have transport, uh, accommodation, uh, equipment, or fashion, if you want. We have alimentation. With the small differences that transport here plays a much bigger part. Here it's 52%, other studies show 70%, and this is because Skiing uh, implies people traveling back and forth to the mountains. 
So this uh, means a lot of kilometers, and they are usually not done on a bicycle. Well, some of my friends do, but not me. Um, so of course, if you want to decarbonize key, you need to work on each of those, but transport play a really big role. And on the other side, which is also interesting, is that um, the carbon footprint related to operating the ski resort. So this includes uh, running the ski lift, the snow guns, and grooming of the slope. It's only 3%. Um, and this is mainly because it relies on electricity, which is uh, decarbonized uh, in Switzerland and in France. But as we're going to see later, um, it's not, I mean, the, the impact of skiing is not only about greenhouse gas emissions, there are also other factors. So if we want to decarbonize skiing, we need to uh, promote uh, people to come to the mountains in a sustainable way. And I think in Switzerland, because we already have a really good transportation network, uh, I think the main focus should be on that. Um, of course, um, to scale that and to, to attract more people, uh, we need to have a better infrastructure, especially uh, what we call the last kilometers, because uh, it's al always uh, the most difficult to cover, and it's al always kind of a, a reason uh, for the most people to, to not take it. Of course, sustainable mobility also includes uh, car sharing, having smaller cars, uh, e-mobility, especially for people uh, living far from city centers where the, where the public transport offer is uh, pretty bad. Okay, so now we see uh, the same as before, uh, uh, a study that was mandated by the ski resort of Verbier, uh, but here we only see the, the greenhouse gases from the mobility and from operating the ski resorts. And as we see before, uh, most of the carbon impact comes from the mobility of, of the visitors. And then if you look now um, at the emission from the mobility, in different category for each means of transportation. You see that, for example, in Verbier, 60% of the people comes by car, which account for about 30% uh, of the emission. So in green here, uh, sorry, I didn't mention in green, it's the percentage of tourists that comes to Verbier by this or this means of transportation. In red, the corresponding relative emission, and in yellow, the, the distance traveled. So 60% of people come by car, that produce about 30% of the emissions. Uh, then you have about 10% of the people coming by plane from within Europe, which account for quite a large, almost 40%. Uh, there is really a small fraction of people coming from overseas, obviously by plane, which account for also 30%. And then only 5% take the train. Um, so this was before they launched what we call the Verbi Express, or so the direct train from Geneva to uh, Le Champ. And then we saw a few people take the bus, which has a good ratio in terms of number of people and distance traveled compared to the relative emissions. So now, if you look at where comes from the people that ski, that are using the ski lift in Switzerland, we see that two thirds of the skier days come from within Switzerland and then 25% from uh, nearby European country like Germany, so 10%, United Kingdom, France, Netherlands, um, country that already have train line, for example, that comes to Switzerland. So in theory, if we will improve the offer by, uh, I don't know, creating more night train or making it, e making it easier with the luggage, and we improve the attractivity, maybe with the price, also have combined offer with discounts on the ski pass. In theory, it could be more than 90% of the skier coming to the ski resort with a low carbon way. And as professional work riders, they also have, um, I mean, it's a, driving, it's a driving force in the ski industry. I think they could also play a role in building those new narratives uh, that we need to uh, promote a more sustainable practice. And this was, uh, this photo was taken during the, the 
shooting of the movie Shelter four years ago, which has now a more than one million view online and which uh, was shown at dozens of film festivals. And the goal in this movie was to only take public transportation and our split boards. So it's snowboard that you can separate in two to use as uh, touring skis to go up. So we took the train and our split boards to go sleep in alpine huts and try to explore uh, a bit further our local mountain in search of really nice mountains uh, to snowboard and to film. And what I should mention also that is that as a passionate uh, snowboarder, uh, when I was a teenager, I really grew up watching movies, a uh, skin snowboard movie in which in single one of them, you will have tons of footage of helicopters, SUV, planes, etc., as if it was uh, an inherent part of the lifestyle associated to the sport. And I think this is a bit also what we try to trying to change. So those two photos, there are um, there are photos of me on the cover of of the Swiss snowboarding snowboarding magazine called Whiteout, and I had the op the chance to make it on the front page uh, twice. First, it was at the early early stage of my career in 2011. And then second, it was uh, during the shooting of the movie Shelter in 2019. And at first you can think, okay, uh, those two photos are pretty similar. Same guy doing a jump on the snowboard uh, in pristine snow, and that ends up on the cover in the same magazine. But if you look behind in terms of carbon emission, which I, I really like to do, it's whole different stories. So the first one was uh, in the middle of the Canadian Rockies. Um, and then there, the common practice is to have a big SUV, to pull a trailer and put a snowmobile on top of it so you can access really remote uh, backcountry places like this one. And in total, with the flight, this accounts for about a carbon budget of three ton of equivalent CO2 for this uh, first magazine cover. And then on the second one, uh, it was in Arola in Swiss, on the way up to go to La Cabane des Vignettes, for the people who knows. And basically we took the train from Geneva to Sion, then the bus, and then we hike for a ridiculously small amount of CO2. So here it's just to illustrate that um, sometimes we can achieve the same results, uh, but with a really different uh, environmental impact. And obviously, I really hope that this could apply also a bit in the ski industry. So I said before also that uh, equipment has also uh, uh, a role. I mean, as it's also part of the carbon footprint of skiing. And then here I think brands, they also have a responsibility to take. And some are really leading the way. So I'm not going to go too much into details, but in the outdoor uh, gear industry, it's a bit the same challenge that in the fashion industry. There are three major problems. First is that uh, the production is done in countries uh, where uh, coal, well, well, the electricity and the heat is mainly based on coal and gas. And because of some of the processing steps require a lot of heat and electricity, it has a high carbon footprint. For example, uh, the most for a snow jacket, it's color dyeing, which produces actually the more uh, of CO2. Another problem, uh, it's overproduction and overconsumption. Uh, we tend to use uh, less and less our clothes and accumulating always more and more. And this is also a really complex problem because it implies also rethink a bit the business model behind. But um, in general, there are also brands uh, finding solution in this direction. And then finally, uh, the last um, point is that a lot of materials to produce those jackets are based on uh, oil, uh, based on petrol, and um, especially like for the synthetic fibers uh, in the outer jackets. And here also there are alternatives. As I said, um, I talk a lot about global warming and greenhouse gases, but it's by far not the only environmental impact of skiing. There are 
others, uh, for example, uh, land artificialization, which uh, can result in the fragmentation of natural habitat, uh, and also in land impermeabilization, which can uh, produce uh, landslide and flood. Uh, there is also deforestation to build new uh, ski lifts and, and, um, and slopes. There is also human disturbance uh, in winter, which is important because it can lead to mortality from animals because in winter uh, they have low energy reserves. And this uh, is actually a, a growing problem because of the democratization of outdoor sports and the over-frequentation. There is also soil damages due to uh, slope and snow compaction, etc. And of course, artificial snow that, uh, that uh, needs uh, lots of energy and, uh, and water consumption. So for the people like me who like to, to go ski touring but doesn't want to impact the wildlife too much, there are four uh, official rules to respect. Um, the first is to respect the designated wildlife area and wildlife reserves. Uh, you can find them on uh, Swiss Topo. Uh, it doesn't cover so many areas, so I think there is enough space uh, to find outside those uh, refuge for the animals. Um, you should also stay on the path and designated route in the forest, if possible. Of course, not always possible, but basically here you can adopt the funnel logic. So. At higher altitude, we have less impacts, so we can spread out, and as soon as we get into the forest, it's a bit better to stay more on the same tracks. Um, avoid also forest edges and snow-free surface, because that's what the wildlife is looking for in winter. And if you have a dog, uh, keep it on the lead, uh, especially in the forest. So my take-home message uh, for tonight is that winters we know winters will become less and less attractive, uh, regardless of the scenarios. But in scenarios with strong mitigation, I think skiing could remain uh, viable uh, towards the end of the century. And I think the skiing industry is a really good messenger for highlighting the reality of climate crisis. And here it could play also a positive role uh, in the fight against climate change. Um, it's also important for Alpine Resort to start a reflection and diversify their activities to be more resilient uh, in case of snow scarce winter. And then finally, uh, the ski industry uh, must become greener uh, in a world with ongoing uh, environmental awareness in order to keep its popularity and attractivity. And I think also because it's our duty to protect uh, those natural landscapes that we like to go in. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mathieu. It was very interesting. I invite our tonight guest to join me on stage, please. Everyone can take a mic on the table. Fine, perfect. Welcome. Merci, <laughs> thanks. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this panel about the future of skiing in Switzerland. My name is Julie Cumer. I'm a journalist uh, for the news podcast Le Point J and Le Short at RTS, and also a big fan of winter sports, so I'm very glad to be here tonight. Um, this talk is going to take place in two parts. First, we're going to ex ex exchange a few words here, and then it will be your turn. Um, you'll have 15 minutes to ask your questions to our four guests guests who I'd like to welcome and who I'm going to introduce very briefly to you. First, Marlene Marconi. She's a sports scientist who grew up in Davos. She's now in charge of sustainability for Swiss Ski, president of the association Snow Sustainability, which is very difficult to say. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Um, Michael Lenning, you already saw him. 
is full professor at the Laboratory of Cryospheric Sciences here at EPFL, academic director for CLIMAT, the, cent the Center for Climate Impact and Action, and he already told you, but we can sum it like that, he spends all his life studying snow, right? Welcome, Mikael. <laughs> the passion Sebastian Travelletti has for a ski leads him more than 80 days per year on the slopes and to many jobs in relation with snow sports. CEO of Swiss Peak Resort, president of Anzer Ski Facilities and Anzer Tourism, vice president of Magic Pass, and I stop here, even if I could go. I could go on for Sorry. a moment. <laughs> Welcome, Mick. <laughs> and of course, Mathieu Cher, you already know him, you know everything about him now, so we can begin with our panel. Um, first thing we have in mind, maybe when we think about snow sports and ecology, is the amount of energy that ski facilities need. We've seen in Mathieu's presentation that it's there, it's not the most red and green things, but it's there. Um, how do you see it, Sebastian? How, how do you see this, this amount of energy that ski resorts need? Yes, I see it, but what I feel it, I will say the lift company are not the biggest impact. I think it's everything around, all the economy around it, and the most biggest part is the transport. We know it, we are working on it, the main problem today, any guest want to go to ski, doesn't like it. We see it. You, you talk about the Verbier Express, and Verbier is trying 5-6%. In Magic Pass, we try it with SBB to have people moving, and we sponsor it, and we have more or less no success. We see only 0.6% of the total skier on the days where we have offer that are taking public transportations. And it's a big, big part of our future that we need to solve. But today, it's not easy. And it's how we will motivate everyone to try to change. But I think the change is not only for ski destinations, it's globally. And that's where we have the biggest, biggest part to work on. Yeah, we all know that we like to have the car, put the material in the car, and then go directly on the slopes. How can we, how can we maybe change that? Well, I mean, honestly, I've been doing that at the professional level for 10 years. And I mean, there's no many other writers that does it. Also, I mean, maybe I'm one out of 100. But um, the more you do, actually, uh, the more I find it uh, nice. But of course, if you look at... Um, the usage of the people, it needs to be practical. Right? The, the first reason that somebody will take one or another type of transportation is not for ecological reason, it's because it has to be practical. And for me, it ends up that I live in the city of Geneva. Um, most of my friends live uh, in uh, uh, the Chablais or in Valais, so I always take the train, uh, and I'm much better in the train reading a book or something that driving alone. But of course, then we need to find uh, also promote it uh, in order that other people does it. And I think, I still think that ski resort can do more because every time I go in a ski resort, I see big, big advertising of car driving on the snow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think there's still some progress. <laughs> Marlene, you work on another level. We are talking here about individual level when we go for a weekend or for ski holidays on the slopes. Um, how do you work on that with Swiss Ski for, I don't know, the planes that you need to take to go on the competitions or during the summer when you need to practice on other countries? How do you work on that? Yeah, it's a really difficult question because, well, our athletes, they have to travel um, because it's an international sport. But um, what we try, for example, at Swisski is that we change the cars for, for, for our fleet for, uh, to e-mobility. But this takes time. So, and this is only, I think, uh, just a small step. So, and what we hope for is that the race cattle will be optimized so that uh, they don't have to fly like we have it now, that they don't have to fly to Aspen and come back. And this is really senseless. And this is, but this is not 
something that we can do at SwissKey, but uh, that must be the International Federation who changed that. And uh, but I think there is a uh, there is a uh, lot space for improvement. But the questions about uh, training in summer is a difficult question because last year the the, race, uh, the, the ski, alpine skiing people, they went to uh, South America because there are the best conditions. But we also had some uh, snowboarders, they said no, they don't want to go to New Zealand because of the CO2 emission. And they, I don't know where they trained, but they didn't flew to, to New Zealand. But, so there is a change also within the athletes. Uh, that they don't want to do everything, but we will see. In the end, it's about the sport and it's about the medals, and this is what counts. Optimizing the schedule of the races, that's very interesting. Do we need maybe, Michael, to optimize our schedule? Meaning, we have to admit, okay, now we won't go skiing on Christmas because snow won't be there, and we just need to accept it. Yeah, I, th I think that could be a very, very important point that we try to live more in, in sync with uh, what nature offers. So we see it also for those people that live in ski areas, perfect snow conditions towards uh, the springtime and then uh, people start traveling to the beaches while uh, the skiing would still be really good. Uh, this, of course, not the perfect powder maybe then uh, towards spring, but I think to live more in sync with that, but it's also a bit against uh, human nature and in, in maybe in, in two aspects because I think the, the skiing industry has realized that people really like to come in November simply because of lack of alternatives of good outdoor um, activities in this dark time of the year between November and, and Christmas. And so now they have been uh, investing quite a bit in, in, in providing good uh, skiing conditions very early in the season because this is where, when people like to come. So, I mean, answering your question, I think it's, it's, it's really also the, the individual behavior. And maybe as a hypothesis, uh, do, you could also say that the reason why in climate change questions, progress of society is so slow has fundamentally to do with that, that, you know, with, with every with every of these uh, climate effects, somebody is making business, somebody is earning money from the transport we saw it, you know, we see the, the car manufacturing industry, the, the fuel industry, the, air, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the aviation industry, and so maybe this is also a reason why we make uh, not as, as fast progress as we could be, because it means to uh, destroying somebody's business model. Sebastian, do you want to add something about this period in autumn where we need sun and we need something because we are so depressed <laughs> about the lack of light and we want to come to you and ski? No, I, th I think two aspects. The first aspect, clearly November, we have a so much strong request from our customers. They want to go skiing as early as they can. For sure, what we need to understand, all the investment we have done in ski resort, it's pretty high, and we need to do amortization over 40 years today, we say for lift and so on. But clearly, more we can be open, more we have a better revenue, and it's clear that for us, it's very important as an operator. On the other side, what we see and what we need to think about and it's really when you see uh, the graph regarding foreigners coming skiing. And I was on a debate with someone from France saying, okay, we don't want any more the British. But I say clearly, if the British are not coming to you, will come to us, will come to Austria. They will find alternative because the human want to go and it will go. It's not that we will be restrictive, we will not go anymore. And if all the Alps will be very restrictive, what will happen? It will fly over to Canada or US. It's really clear on that. We need just to be careful. It's not avoiding people going, I would say skiing in November, avoiding foreigners to come. It's how we can find solutions to decrease the impact. But clearly, it's not only ski resort, it's a global solution. And I think it's really important. And when we see the uh, airline industry or the train and so on, it's how we can improve. And when you say it's how convenient we, be, we can be, why we don't have so much customer taking public transportations? If we have a family with two kids, try to take your ski gears. 
ski, ski boots and so on, and go on a trip for a single day. Mm. If you go for a week, it's different. But for a single day, you want to avoid that and to have more flexibility and more convenient. And that's our biggest issue we need to solve as ski resort. It's how we can provide solution on very easy renting on the slope or at the base of the ski resort to have lockers, to have a lot of facilities. But the mindset of all our customers are not on these, I would say, paths right now. Just, yeah, Matthew. So when you say the mindset of the people, people want to go skiing on artificial snow in November, they want to come with their big car, this is not something that, I mean, it's also driven by uh, everything around it, like the advertising, as I say, I grew up watching ski and snowboard movie when you see helicopters, you see SUV, and this is also the imaginary that we need to change, and that's why, I mean, doing a movie like I did, to try to tell another story and show another way, and because I don't think it's really like in the gene that people want to, to go like this. I think it's also the offer that is missing, it's the imaginary that we produce that is uh, really based on overconsumption and all, all that going uh, along. Just, just want to, to add something. I, I fully agree with you. The main problem we have in our ski industry today, it's only when you get volume that we will have uh, an earning. Otherwise, you will not be reliable to keep going in the future. And we need just to be careful. When we started with the Magic Pass, it was really to increase the number of ski or visit. We did it, and we did it very strongly in a lot of ski resort. But the main thing at the end, it's which solutions we can find. And everything in the ski industry is based on volume. We are not on ski touring, we are not just on, I will say, a powder skiing only solutions. We just need to think about, we have a lot of employees that, are re that need to rely on the ski industry. If the ski industry will fall down, all these people will come to the city. You will just move the, the different problems in terms of impact, and it's how we can be less impact by keep going on this industry and still developing it. But I don't have the solution right now. It's <laughs> not that we are ready to, to be in the futures, but I think it's a long uh, journey to find this solution. And, but we are open to, to find it. And if we talk about this reducing the impact when we ski, for example, in November, and we need the, to produce some artificial snow, um, Miguel, there are some solutions that can help to produce artificial snow in a better way? Which are they? Well, first, first of all, uh, some, some of our uh, research uh, shows that uh, you can uh, reduce also the amount of energy spent on artificial snow uh, production by using the right uh, type of technology. But then also there the technology uh, uh, progress is sometimes hindered by dominating uh, uh, companies that have the market. And once you know, a ski area has decided to go for a certain brand, it's almost impossible to change because all the infrastructure is also tailored to this particular way of doing things. So this is one thing. But there's also, you know, they were also very close to our research. What we can also do is to now with better and better weather forecasts that go into seasonal forecasts, we can uh, anticipate a bit what the next uh, week or two weeks will bring. So avoiding to make artificial snow in a, on a November, a cold November day, knowing that there's a fern uh, event coming that will eat it away anyway, is something that uh, could help to improve the impact of the early snow production. Marlon, you wanted to add something? Yeah, and I think we also have to see the more practical side because sometimes the the, the system how they produce snow or how it is built in the in the village or so is really bad because I know one example where they take the water from this side of the valley, bring it to the other side of the valley, have to cool it down and then can produce snow. And this makes no sense. So this is yeah, just because the water heats up so, and then it's warm to make snow. So they have to, and then have to, they have to pump it so that it's in the mountain. So this makes no sense. So the skiing area, they really have to put this on the agenda to improve their uh, their artificial snow production 
systems because it's much easier for this area, for example, it would be the solution to have like a artificial um, lake. So then you have the water up, you can bring it down. So, and this is, uh, I think this is very important that the, the, the destinations really get active to improve their, their, their systems. Even with your experience that you have better forecasting, uh, they, sometimes they also have like GPS measurement to see which is the perfect or the best um, Snow deep, exactly. Yeah, so that they don't produce too much snow, etc. So I think there's a, a lot of thing you can do, and also you have to have like new um, snow machines because the the new ones they need less uh, energy than old ones. Yeah. So there's a lot what you can do if you really want to change something. You told me just before the talk about uh, production of snow for next year's championship. How is it made? Yeah, so often maybe you heard about this uh, snow farming when you ha when you store the, the snow uh, and uh, during summer and oft I th I thought it's a uh, natural snow they store but often it's uh, it's uh, artificial snow they produce now when it's cold so they can fill their storage um, things so that they have enough snow to yeah be, be ready for the for races etc or even for tourism. Yeah. Is snow farming is a good solution, Miguel? In many cases, yes, and and, and even you know even if it's with uh, artificial snow, that's not the main problem because if you were to make big piles of natural snow, you spend more energy in making the pile than in actually producing it locally from from water. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, and and in many cases, if you know this 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 um, uh, transport is not uh, is not too far, and it's it's a local solution, it can. It can be uh, quite ecologic in addition to uh, fulfilling the needs of having early snow in the season. Because the problem is really that in, in, in November or when you need to have the snow, then if your days are limited and uh, the, the, the closer you are at melting, the, the worse is the snow that you produce. And at the end, you're also spending more energy because you're less, less effective, less efficient. So we need maybe electrical a uh, car to just move the snow. Are we working on this kind of thing? There are sometimes the, the, uh, the piston bully, I don't know the English word, but it's the, the, the piston bully. <laughs> they, <laughs> they have uh, H2O or, uh, H or like this, um, how is it? The Hydrogen. The, this, the fuel, the... the Hydrogen. Yeah. Hydrogen. Hydrogen, yeah, exactly. So snow, ma snow machine. Yeah. Mm. Sebastian, are you working on this, like changing maybe the fleet of your um, <laughs> of your vehicles to solar or hydrogen or? No, not right now. Just to be clear, you know, like uh, one snow grooming machine, it's about half a million Swiss francs. You try to get for like seven to eight thousand hours. I would say, depending on ski resort, it's between eight to ten years. Then to change the fleet, it will take times. They are just becoming since now a year or two with new machine. One even with, uh, I would say, standard power supply, like an electrical cars, and they are developing that right now. Uh, every uh, manufacturer is working on different solutions. But the main problems today is that it's not clearly uh, the power of the machine. It's more how much time you can use it because you know you need to rely on eight, nine hours. And it's clear today when you see a machine, uh, I would say it's about 20, 25 liters per hour. It needs quite a lot for sure. Uh, but independent of that, that the only energy that is not with electricity for a ski resort, everything we are I will say not a big impact as we have seen on the slide, but even if we do that, we need to be careful on, on this level. Uh, and also on, I will say, snowmaking solutions. We are working a lot. And I think right now with the cost of electricity, that's a big change for ski resort. They need to save a lot of power supply because the electricity was until this year again, like six cents. And we know that some ski resorts are paying already right now like 35 cents 
when you compare it six times, I think we will go up to 15, 20 for sure from six, and it's a big, big cost for ski resort. Then we need to, to save, and it will be the best solution. The price increase will force us to find solution for sure. Another thing we talked about, Marlene, was the hotel. And you told me, like, for example, for Swiss ski teams, you have not many choices because, yeah, you need to park a lot of people in all the rooms and then you are happy if you can find something. But then you told me on an individual level, we can maybe choose an hotel that is already doing something or are using renewable energy or things like that. And also choosing an hotel without a wellness. I almost cried, but okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you told me, you would be very interested to know what Sébastien um, thought about that because he's working in the hotel industry too. So I'm asking that for you to Sébastien. <laughs> yeah, regarding you know, the eating solutions, we have put a new solution in place by producing our own eat. It means with a small wood placket, we say. We produce electricity with that and then we can produce Due to the electricity we produce, we produce worms, and we produce our electricity for uh, all eating of all buildings. Uh, we have, I would say, much less impact, clearly due that all the wood plaquettes are locally produced and delivered. And it means for us, you know, no oil, no uh, gas, and I think it's really important to find solution. It's, it's a cost. Actually, it's not cheap, but we are looking to be more efficient also for, for that in these directions. But it's an, for me, it has a bigger impact in a ski resort, all the real estates, hotels, apartments. And the main problems too, what we are working on, it's just not to be open like 20 weeks a year. It means 16 weeks for winter, four weeks during uh, summer. And we are looking to be open, and we do it already today, 46 weeks a year. And for us, it's really important to be more sustainable because to produce this, I would say, type of lodging for only 20 weeks has no meaning. And that's our target. Yeah, Mathieu, we talked huh? about, I don't know if we can say that in English, but cold beds, les lits froids. Yes. And, and that was another point that you raised when we talked. No, I, don't, I think yes, sir. As I said, it's important to try to, to optimize, so, so not having an hotel that is only, that is empty uh, half of the year, but also if we want to bring people more in the mountains at all season, it means more traveling and more transportation. So it needs even more that we solve this problem of trying to bring people in the mountains in a better, uh, more sustainable way, right? Yeah, I think we had a very good input there. I think that the, the, our system is still very much driven by market forces, and so the price is extremely important. So if we, for example, can have a, a system in which uh, the energy use is taxed by for what it is actually used for, if it's a luxury product, let's say at the wellness hotel, um, or is it the, the daily use of, uh, of, uh, of your kitchen at home, Maybe this could be a solution to become more sustainable because then um, both sides, you know, those that request the services and those that offer it, they will immediately react on that, just as a, as a thought. We need to think about that. <laughs> um, Mathieu, you also talked about the material. I mean, like you talked about the clothes and things. Marlene, how do you, you have to buy a lot of material that would be clothes or skis or everything that the athletes need. How do you work on that? Yeah, this is also a huge topic because, um, yeah, our athletes, they often get every year new clothes, new everything. And yeah, so we really try, well, and in the end, it's not our decision because it's a decision of our partners because they want to have always the, the new uh, designs, etc. Especially when they have Instagram stories, etc. So they are not allowed to wear old things and so on. But what we try is uh, just to uh, find um, clothes where we can have, for example, two years or three years cycle so that uh, they, for example, when 
like shirts or things that you can wear under the jacket. It's not such a huge topic if, if it's uh, two years old, if it's still good. And what we had uh, last summer, we had like a big change of our main sponsor. So we had had a lot of um, clothes with the wrong uh, brand on it. So and yeah, and so what we did is we had a like a um, partnership with TechAid so that the um, athletes could give back. Uh, their clothes and uh, clothes were recycled. Well, it was a downcycling because it's very difficult to uh, recycle this um, sports material because it's often, it's not like, um, not from the same material, so it must be 95% the same material, then you can recycle it uh, in a better way. Yeah, but in the end we had a solution for some clothes and what we also did was like a rebranding, so we took some of the clothes back, brought it to the textile fabric and they took off the, the brands and put on new brands, so the new brands. So yeah, we try to do things, but it's uh, very difficult and I really hope also that this, uh, this uh, textile industry will become more sustainable or more in direction to, to this uh, circular economy because this would, be, this would help quite a lot. Too. But it's a long way to go there. And you said before like two athletes didn't want to fly last year. Um, how do you see the bond between nature, environment, and the athletes as they are, just like Mathieu, maybe half of the year in the mountains, really close from nature? And does that make, like with Mathieu, <laughs> sparkle something and they have really this conscious? Yeah, I think it's difficult to answer because they have their passion, and this is, for example, skiing, and they want to do races. And if you want to do races, you are in this business. And this business is not that sustainable. But in the end, you still have this love and this passion for nature and snow and the mountains, etc. And I think sometimes for them, it's also not easy because, um, yeah, they, they, real, they, they see that with doing what they have passion for, they are destroying what they have passion for. But in the end, yeah, so it's difficult. So I think they have, um, they must have like a stronger connection, but they don't have some, they cannot choose really. Because when they want to do ski races, they have to fly from here to Aspen because ski race is there and they have to wear this jacket. So difficult. How did you feel about that, Mathieu, when we talked with your other uh, snowboarders, professional snowboarders, colleagues? How did you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really, I mean, it's different uh, among different athletes. Some are really fully committed like me and other, they really, um, they care about those subjects, but they a bit scared to, to talk publicly about it. And uh, some they don't care, okay. But what we're trying to do, especially with Protect Our Winter, is try to, to say, okay, progression over perfection. So we try to encourage people, nobody is perfect, even, well, if you're doing races and your next race in the US, you have to go. Um, so even if you're not perfect, uh, you can still raise your voice to, um, to ask for climate protection, uh, to encourage people to go vote when there is important votation, um, and or, I don't know to to encourage people to um, choose more sustainable brand or use the train when they're in Switzerland, and we really try to encourage all the athletes to to say, okay, uh, we all depend on the snow, and uh, we can have all a role, and uh, it's better to to be the voice uh, for climate protection, even if you're not perfect, than just not, uh, yeah, not doing anything. Marlene, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, I really like this, uh, this voting of imperfectness of Pau because it is like that, so we can, it's also okay when you go to a wellness hotel, so because sometimes <laughs> you just deserve it, but uh, it, it starts with small steps. So we have like two uh, or more level, it's really complex as you probably realize, so, and there are a lot of things you can do in infrastructure, etc. but this is not your decision. There's, it's, it's like, yeah, the organizations or destination have to do that, but on the individual level, yeah, you can just do small steps. Sometimes I also recommend, so like if I know that someone drives by car to work, I say, hey, okay, it's okay when you drive to the 
winter day with car, but then maybe you can take the train for the next week so to go to work. So that's just, you know, to bring this like, so, oh, now I, I'm not allowed to go skiing anymore. So no, it's okay, but maybe you can do something else at the, on a, in another area of your life. And so I think it's very important that we cannot be perfect, but everyone can do a small step. And this is what also what our athletes can do. So they can do small steps and they can be the voice. Yeah. Find a balance to reduce. Miguel, you wanted no, to ask something? Maybe also directly on this, you, you, this is basically the subject of compensation that you, are, are, are you, <laughs> are you um, that compensating as your two emissions for, for your athletes? No, we don't. Be, we, Why not? Well, the thing is that uh, the FIS, the International uh, F uh, Skiing Federation, they do compensation mm -hmm. for all the uh, events. So, but well, I'm not a big fan of compensation, and I'm not a fan of how they do compensate. And we did at Swisky, we d decided not to do compensations because it's, I know it's another business in in uh, sustainability, and I think. It's more a business than it really helps, but this is my personal opinion, so no, we don't do compensation. More greenwashing than compensation, maybe. Yeah. I, I, I do think it depends, you know, there, there, there has been uh, many, many initiatives that have been shown to be more greenwashing than, than real, but there's maybe also good ones, so there's, uh, you know, the, the basically, you, it's like what you said, you know, if you can compensate on your personal level, you, you do this and then you don't do this. And I think also for the, the rest of, because we have to be aware of, you know, of course, it's, uh, somebody said the sentence, maybe you deserve the wellness hotel. <laughs> but if everybody on the earth deserves the wellness hotel, we are, we are not, we are not making any progress. And then so there needs to be, for those extras, there needs to be some sort of a compensation then. Okay, I learned my lesson. No more wellness for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the clock is ticking and I think the audience time has come. There is a catch box. Where is it? It's there, which I find really funny. I discovered it today. It's apparently a cube, but it's also a microphone. And uh, just raise your hand if you have a question. And uh, Joris, We'll throw the catch box at you very gently, I promise. And then you can pass it to someone else who raises it, his or her hand after you. Ah, there, there, there. Uh, Joris, you can choose. <laughs> it's here. Oh, it works. I um, like this thing. I have a question for all of you, but mostly for uh, Sebastian. Travelletti, because um, I think that especially high mountains in Switzerland are a really hot spot when talking about energy production, especially solar panels. And so it's interesting to me uh, that is, it was not mentioned a lot of time that a lot of the CO2 emissions also depends on how the energy production is done. And I mean, it could be a solution or at least something to think about to uh, put, like to install a lot of uh, solar panel production in uh, high mountains in Switzerland. So this could be also a possible sustainable way to improve this business. But I mean, obviously it's also a little bit problematic because on the other side, maybe it's not so pleasing to see. Uh, but I think that's the question, like, the what's your thinking about it? The balance between aesthetic and f carbon footprint. <laughs> no, I think, I think the question is really interesting. I see two aspects. First aspect that the authorizations. It's very complex in Switzerland to get authorization in high mountain for a lot of things including building a lift, building you know, snowmaking, or also putting solar panel. Our biggest issue right now in Switzerland is clearly to have, I would say, new legal, new rules that we are able to do it in a good way, according nature's environment and efficiency. But we are, I would say, the canton of Valais is working on that and is pushing very hardly. 
In terms of lift company, you have a few examples like Zermatt Bergbahnen that is doing a lot in solar panel producing in every building and so on. But you know, when you have enough capacity in terms of uh, earning, then you can invest. And the biggest problem right now of the lift companies they are trying to invest a lot, but more likely in snowmaking, in lift, to be up to date, and secondly, will happen all the electricity or power supply part. But for sure, it's something everyone is looking for it. Someone wants to add something? Yeah, I think okay. this is a very good point. I think the, uh, the idea is to try to, to use as much as possible uh, existing infrastructure, and if not infrastructure, uh, landscape that is close to existing infrastructure, close to ski areas for additional production. And, but politics is not always making that easy. So we, we have to really, I agree with what was just said, you know, the, the politics, they need to be, I would say, much more um, uh, science informed for, for taking decisions because even with the new law that now tries to push for winter electricity um, production via uh, large installations of solar PV in mountains, my personal feeling is one has almost overshot the goal now with that law. Because what happens now is that uh, we have these, um, I don't want to name it, but we have these suggestions of huge installations in the mountains, you know, like a whole valley plastered by solar PV. While we are not yet using um, the proximity to existing infrastructure, but the law is now you need to produce that much and it needs to be done by 2025, which is unrealistic anyway. Uh, but so then the projects don't get selected uh, according to the lowest impact on the environment, but they get uh, selected by speed of implementation and size, which is not always a good criterion. So I think they're, they're, I completely agree that politics need to, to work more um, science-informed and, um, and, and, uh, and more criteria. careful in general. Mm -hmm. And change the criteria. Thank you very much. Thank you for questions. Where is the catch box? Coming to you. <laughs> so does this work here? Yeah, thanks. Um, so my question is going to be intentional, intentionally a bit provocative, but I'm still going to ask it. Um, Shoot. I do believe in human resi resilience, but I think that resilience is also about acknowledging that climate change will make it almost impossible to continue doing the sport we love as we as we know it, and that maybe we just have to find different ways to do outdoor activities instead of um, artificially trying to create the conditions we knew in the past. So, what do you think about this? Agreed. I, wants to. <laughs> I, I fully agree. Um, maybe I go on quickly. I fully agree, but I still think it's a good, uh, saving the ski is a good message uh, to try is. to reduce emission because at the end, anyway, everything we save, it will be, uh, it will be, better, be better to avoid much life-threatening problem due to climate change in the future, it deadly it waves, uh, drought, etc. And it's something that uh, ski destinations already have to deal with. So this, this winter, uh, there were some areas they had to uh, close the, the winter area, and I think they opened it for biking. And I think when the destination is probably under, I don't know, 1,800 meters or 2,000 meters, Above sea level, they have to think about that. It's uh, and yeah, they really, really need to become more flexible, uh, especially the, the destinations. They don't have the, the, the high enough highness, if you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can. I think we we'll all agree in long terms. In short terms, we cannot just shut down our facilities due to the lack of snow. It's a long-term process, but it's not something that we will be that will happen in a different ski resort in the next 10, 15 years. It's a long way, but for sure, uh, if we see these visions and we have no impact on CO2 by 2050 or 2080, as you show us, then we know we are over, and we don't want to be over. But we need, I will say. Uh, uh, mid-term visions to be sure that we can keep going on our facilities and 
do the change needed to be sure that skiing will still happen in 2100. Will not be here anymore, but for sure for our next generation that we can still offer skiing. And it's also a topic we have to discuss at Swiss Ski. For example, we know there are some, for example, ski jumping, it's possible without snow because often they already have the, the starting ramp or the jump, the jump <laughs> without snow and they can land uh, in an area without snow. But I wonder how, uh, for example, cross-country uh, cross skiing or ski cross, border cross will develop because, yeah, for that, Right now, you need snow. Maybe for cross-country skiing, you could do that also with the um, with the roller skis roller ski. and also biathlon. You can do. There are all, all there are already summer um, races uh, with the uh, with the roller skis. So yeah, but uh, also the the sports the the, the, the the top sports need to change. I think we will see both. Right, we we see that there's adaptation that goes uh, in accepting uh, less uh, snow. But there's also at least the midterm adaptation to say that the skiing will still be possible at high elevation. We, we see, and uh, we also saw, to give back a provocative answer, we also saw that uh, artificial snowmaking is, is not the, the big driver. So it's really the transport and there's other you know, screws that we should first, uh, first address. And, and so there will be a mix of, of these two solutions. Just one thing regarding artificial snow last summer we use the system of artificial snow for all the cow on the mountain to provide water. Otherwise, they had to go back to lower elevations to get water. And the other problem was to get the grass. It was delivered from outside Switzerland. At the end, the impact of CO2 was much more higher. But what we see in the future, that perhaps the combinations that the snowmaking will allow our agricultures here in Switzerland to keep on high elevations even if we have a dry summer. And it's not bad at all too. We just need to leverage everything and to balance it correctly. But just to see how we can use some facilities already in place for other purports. Yeah, there's lots of technical possibilities. We are here at DPFL trying to find good solutions. But I come back to the problem that the regulations are are not always good, and uh, I think shit happens out there. So really, I, I know, I'm not going to name it, I know, but the ski area that had the possibility to, to have an extra reservoir up on the ski area and, and to produce electricity via hydropower. And because of the regulations were such that it was cheaper for them to use this self-produced electricity, which was on public gro uh, grounds, by the way, to heat their buildings than to use a heat pump. They didn't install heat pumps in addition. And so this still happens today. It's a question of, uh, you know, you guys are not all holy, so <laughs> if it's about money. And, and so then, uh, but with the correct regulations, a lot would be possible. We should, we should have invited more politicals today. today. You wanted to, no, yo. Th thank you for your question. Next catch behind you. Thanks. Uh, so. You were talking a lot about the individual actions, and I had a question was, what's the position of the government in the International Ski Federation when we see events like the Freeride World Tour or helicopter skiing in many ski Swiss resorts? Uh, for example, in France, heli skiing was forbidden last year. Uh, so what's the position of the, of the government on that? Do you want to answer about? I don't know what the position of the government is. I just know that they put the ski, ski areas on, the, on the, the list to shut down when we don't have in, enough energy. So maybe this says everything, but I don't know. Maybe you know what the government... Do yeah. you want to answer... Sorry, the, Sebastian. Do you want maybe to answer the part for the competitions? Like for the free ride ski tours? Um, free ride ski tours, I don't know, because, um, well, it's new, it also belongs to the FIS, but uh, I don't know uh, nothing about it. But I just know, for example, in uh, winter sports, we have two uh, international uh, federations. It's the uh, FIS, so which belongs nearly every snow sports belongs to it, except Biaslan. And Biaslan is the, in IBU, and they are really progressive uh, uh, related to this sustainability 
things. And the FIS is a little bit more difficult uh, with the new president, so, but I know they are starting to uh, develop their sustainability strategy, and I really hope that they can put some pressure on, also on the events sector. So, maybe, so by the way, um, there, uh, with Protect the Winter again, there is a few uh, famous ski racers that sign a petition uh, addresses to the FIS to to do something about that, to really take on about uh, finding solution, uh, so that also the athletes could continue to compete and uh, yeah, and be in line with uh, their conviction and what they observe on the terrain. And this was signed by 400, more than 400 uh, athletes, and then the IFS also answered. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to add something about No, that? just regarding Ellis King, because Ellis King in Switzerland, it's only 14 dedicated places where you can do it. It's not a free space like you can see in some uh, countries like Canada or other ones. Uh, but for the helicopter companies that we have in Switzerland, more likely in rescue, it's a very important part to keep it, you know, all the fleet. Uh, up to date and to have enough hours of usage for helicopters. It means at the end it's a combination. Uh, and this combination today, it's pretty well, but when you see the number of, of Ellis King, it's not a lot compared to the rest. But it's still that France take away, some other country has taken away, and in terms of politics, you know, the Canton of Valais push it very hardly to keep it, because they had the discussions in our Swiss government about that, like I think a year or two ago, and at the end they didn't change anything. But we don't know what will be the future, and I don't see a big change here, because it's not a, a big thing in Switzerland right now. It's still a... Good, thank you. Do we have time for a last one? Yes, we do. Thank you. Uh, as each one of you has a different perspective on the subject, I'm um, interested to know what do you think personally are the best tools right now that you have to work on the situation for the next years? Who wants to begin? <laughs> Maybe you can just list one or two things that you think are the more important. <laughs> well, for me, especially as president of Snow Sustainability, it's really important to find projects we can do together with our partners. Because in the end, uh, I think the only thing, uh, not the only thing, but the way we can really improve something is when we do it together. And when we, well, in the end, every, as you, we talked about that, everything costs money, and often it's about money, but all the the companies, they also need to become more sustainable, and this we, we need to, to bring together. So this is my, my goal for the next two years, is that we bring our partners together in snow sustainability, snow sustainability so that we can um, support projects to make snow sports more su sustainable. Collaboration. Collaboration. I would say for ski resort, clearly part of the magic pass. One of the targets is clearly to keep going on the trans public transportation offers and to develop it because it has the biggest impact. We know that. Uh, but it's a long term. So we don't have like a, a magic trick to, to, to find it right now and it will happen very easily. Uh, we think that we want to increase the numbers of skiers going through public transportation as a real target in the next years and according already next winter. Thank you, Miquel. Yeah, professionally, it's, it's, uh, it's our task is to show where the, the best locations for renewable energy installations in the mountains, so solar and wind in particular. And privately, it's my pair of skins that I put on my skis. <laughs> yeah. I, on my side, it's uh, still trying to engage uh, more of my colleagues, athletes. And then now we Next thing we're trying to prepare is a petition towards our sponsor to ask our sponsor to not force us to put new cloth every year 
but to produce what we call carryover collection. So that's collection um, with like, uh, you know, one simple color, a timeless design, and then we can keep for as long as it holds. And this is it, the next project. <laughs> nice, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. We already arrived at the end of the panel, but I'm sure that our guests will be very happy to answer further questions that you have during the apéro. I want to thank EPFL for the organization of this event and for inviting me to moderate this panel today. And of course, I want to thank the four of you, um, Marlene Marconi, Michael Lenning, Sebastian Travelletti, and Mathieu Cher for the, this very interesting talk. We have now a lot of thoughts to process for tonight. Thank you so much. And you are now all invited to have a drink with us. And I wish you all a very nice evening. Thank you very much. Thanks.